Hi, this is Jeff Redding from VidMag Television. We're here with Dennis Van Crash from the wonderful band Vanity Crash, one of Cleveland's favorite bands. Um, so, to start out, let's go with Cleveland's premier glam punk band. <laughs> That's what you guys have been referred to as. How do you respond to that? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I think we might be the main band that's in Cleveland that's really carrying that torch from that glam scene from the early to mid 70s, the Bowie, the T-Rex, the Monta Hoople, the Queen, Lou Reed, and things like that. And it's not that we're stuck in that era, it's just that we really kind of... Identify with it. We do identify with it and we, we bring it to the table. We get inspired by that so that obviously it's in, it's reflected in our our songs and we'll do choice covers of from the stuff from that era but at the same time we try to show how that era has affected through the ages through different type of bands in the 80s and 90s and even today um, an example being like we we have covered Lady Gaga's Bad Romance because she was very influenced by that whole thing. If, mm -hmm. if, if David Bowie didn't happen, what's the chance of her doing that type of show that she does with, with both the visual aspect that she brings to the table? Right, and she's actually said that that was one of her influences too. So, And I was going to ask you about that because they, Bowie in that whole era does seem to be one of your primary influences. How do you take that and put it into a song that is vibrant and today and still manage to maintain that original feel? Well, a couple things. One is, as far as in a live performance, we, we, we spin it with, you know, we don't stand there with our flannel shirts and stare at the ground and, <laughs> and we do not have facial hair. Uh, but we do, uh, we try to bring a visual aspect to our show, which I think was real integral to yes. that scene. The other thing is, if you look at the songs from that scene, they're very rooted into the things that were happening in the 50s and the 60s. And the same thing that happens here. Basic chord structures and things like that are always going to be the same. You have your, your one, four, five is, is a root structure, but, and then you work around that. And the rhythms even somewhat are the same. But at the same time, stuff has changed. And so you take those raw elements as foundations and then we build upon it based upon how things change with technologies and stuff like that. We're not afraid to use uh, sequencers or, or that type of stuff that's available to us to incorporate into a song. Mm -hmm. Does that answer? Yeah, and and you're the primary songwriter, right? I am. Yeah. And then Thomas does some. Thomas writes some. I noticed on on the new album, and, and we're going to talk about this Phantasmagoria that's getting ready to come out in a couple of weeks. This is today is the 13th of September, and in 10 days, the 23rd, you're going to be doing a show at the Bob Stop to debut this. That's correct. And. Um, it's got some great artwork on here as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but um, you have a song on here by Steve Simonick, who's been around for a long time on the scene. How did that connect? Well, uh, maybe you don't remember uh, or didn't know, but I was in the last version of System 56. Okay. With Steve and Tom Lash and, and um, Vince on drums and... and, and Paul on keyboards. And that whole band was just really fantastic and I really feel fortunate to have that opportunity to play with them. And Steve and I built a, a, a nice relationship and the song Life on a Cool Curve was my favorite song from the band. Um, it obviously got a lot of airplay in Cleveland mm -hmm. on WMMS and, and, and things like that. And Steve 
moved to California shortly after the band broke up, a couple years after, and but we've we've maintained contact, and I send him my stuff. He unfortunately is not doing anything. I encourage him to because he's an, a fabulous songwriter and he had great vision, um, and he obviously had great ears because he his songs that came out, he did everything for them, and they just were just fantastic. So I talked to him this spring, and I said I'm going to be doing another record. You know, what's, what do you think about if I try to redo Life on a Cool Curve? And he was all for it, so he was pretty excited about doing that. Now that would be pretty interesting too, because the original version of that was heavily electronic, because System 56 was really electronic based, whereas this is very guitar based, and so it's going to be really interesting to see how the two songs, or the two versions of the <laughs> songs work together, and I can't wait to hear that. So. Um, Let's talk real quickly about the artists on here because okay. you do have some pretty heavy hitters as far as the local art community. The cover art on this side here, the front, was done by Lauren Gary Dumb. Lauren Gary Dumb, yes. And um, they actually did the previous EP that we did um, called Love, which had the, if you see it, it's just a great piece. It's, it's kind of their latest series where they do this environmental series and it has the Bride of Frankenstein spraying a can of Raid into her face and she's got these blood, butterflies coming out of her mouth. It's a, it's, a, it's a great looking cover. Yeah. But they did that. And then the back cover here. It's Jim uh, GR. And then inside. And then the inside. We've we got have, two. We've got Claire Cola and this is Tim. I'm not, hopefully I'll get his name pronounced right. It's Swatowski. And then check out the disc. I don't know if you looked at the disc. This is fabulous. And that was also done by Laura and Gary. No, that's actually done by Ashley uh, Rebbit, or Rebeat. And uh, that's that's fun. I like that because she's got these <laughs> these characters just throwing up. And so last time when we did the other EP, we did a similar thing. We had artists that contributed to the disc. And what we tried to do is is really look at given everybody more people an opportunity to participate in a project and so we brought in five if you count Gary and Laura as one but if you count them separate we've got six visual artists and then all the band members and a little bit extended out like using Steve Senemix's song. Do you, do you try to incorporate your artwork into the style or feel of the record or is it just something that just happens to come about? Um, the way it works is I give, I tell the artist what I'm doing and I give them all the songs so they can listen to the songs and I say do whatever you want. Um, I don't want to direct them and say you specifically have to do this, except for Gary. I said, Gary, you know, I've, this band has, this is our fifth release and we never had the band on the cover and I said, make us as cartoon characters. <laughs> Um, superheroes. <laughs> We're not really superheroes, but you know, let's put us on the cover. It would be the first time we'll be on the cover of one of our records. And so that was the only requirement. He could take it any way he wanted to go. And and I guess one more step was the fact that the title track is called Phantasmagoria, which is um, from the 1700s and 1800s. It was. You know they do these projections on screens so it's more like silhouettes now but it, it was usually demonic type stuff horror stuff and it wasn't so much the demonic or the horror thing that i did but the idea of that you would have these projections that would transform the audience into another world mm -hmm. and in a way that's how i wanted to have the record be um, where you're listening to it you not only have the visuals that are little different worlds in and of themselves, but each song are different worlds in and of themselves. Stories of taking you to maybe a different place. So it's like a total immersion kind of thing. In a way, almost uh, almost hearkening back to like the late psychedelic era with the projections on the people and the bands and things like that, and just trying to do that mentally as opposed to sure. in a physical Sure, and, you, and you, as you obviously know, you know, when we do live shows, we, most of the times we have video projection that happens behind us or on us or things like that. So it kind of 
runs in line with that whole idea. Yeah. Um, real quickly, I want to talk to you about the uh, the David Bowie shows that you've done um, because I think that's something that's really incredible. Um, Thomas has been doing a narration, and then you guys play a little bit. So how did that whole thing all come about? I mean, obviously, again, it connects back to your roots as you know the glam period that you get sure, into. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, what 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 happened was. Um, the drummer I had, which was Jason Giacco, a fabulous drummer, um, he was with me for well over 10 years. His whole situation was changing with his family. His family was growing, and he said he had to leave. And through the grapevine, Thomas already found out that that was happening. He, he calls me up, he goes, I think we need to talk. <laughs> so we sat down and met, and he says, you know, I want to play drums for you. Um, this is what I can bring to the table. And I said, that's cool. So this was like November 2015, I think. And he says, I've been doing these Bowie presentations at Baldwin Wallace College for the past, for two years he did them. And he said, I heard Bowie's coming out with a new record on his birthday in January. I want to do this Bowie presentation. I said, that sounds great. And he said, I want to incorporate the band where we'll do um, part of the presentation and have the band follow up that would tie into that particular section of the presentation and then do the rest of the presentation and have the band come back out. So that's what happened. And, you know, unfortunately, when January came around, David had died. David dies. Um, we had a show, it was an afternoon brunch show, which sold out. So we added an afternoon show. That sold out, and we had another show the next day that sold out, and then we added a show the like two weeks later at Musica in Akron, and that sold out. So obviously, David's death was a big factor in that, but the presentation is great because it really kind of like I was telling you about how the influences from people like David Bowie um, extend into today. I think Thomas really shows how those connections are happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, before David passed away, I mean, he was really into um, 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 I'm sorry, uh, Kendrick Lamar, and it, and we see, you know, he's just so huge. But those interesting connections, or even like Arcade Fire, so. Um, if you haven't seen the presentation, we are going to bring it back next year um, to honor David's death and birth in January, and that'll be at the Bob Stop, too. Okay, and you guys have a real working relationship with that place. It's one of the greatest clubs, one of the best rooms in town to hear a show at, to see a show at. It's small, it's intimate, the sound system is great, the people that work there are great, and the money that they raise there all goes back to the music settlement to educate kids and other people about music. And how did you get involved with them to begin with? Um, well, Thomas knew uh, Gabe um, Pollock, who uh, runs the director of the uh, the Bob Stomp, mm -hmm. and so he suggested us do that Bowie show, and we did it. And we bring to the table when we do a show. We really work the show and our production. We're very well self-contained, so. He doesn't have to do anything, and he has a great night, and so he knows that. And so after those first shows, anytime we ask him to do a show, he just says, yeah, just definitely come back. And because the space is, it's a fabulous space, it's got tiered seating so everybody can see the show. It's wide. Um, the acoustics, like you say, are great. The sound system's great. Um, they've got a great bar. Um, they usually will have food. So if you want to eat, you can have some food. It's all there. So what are we going to hear on the 23rd? Obviously the new record. We're going to play the whole new record. Um, and you're going to really hear Vanity Crash. Uh, we only have a couple cover songs that we're doing versus like when we do the Bowie stuff, we have a lot of Bowie stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, I think there's only two, maybe three at the most. But we're going to do two sets. 
We've got, I think there's a total of 24 songs. So we've got a lot of stuff, a lot going back all through to the first album. So we got all five albums. We're going to be represented uh, at that show as far as performance. Um, we're up in the ante as far as our visuals. Um, we've got another singer. Um, she's great. Her name's Nika N uh, Nostalgia. Uh, you'll get to meet her. And um, we're going to have the original art there and the original artist, uh, the artist that created that work. Uh, it's got new merchandise, new t-shirts. It's, it's going to be a fun night. Um, you won't be disappointed if you come. Sounds great. Looking and forward to it. I got one more thing to share on that. Um, we have on the last song on the record, uh, it's a little bit of kind of this melancholy song about um, these kids, primarily these two kids, that are living in this, quote, dying town and they don't see any future for themselves. And we, we find this in a lot of pockets, um, obviously throughout the United States, but throughout the world, obviously England, the whole punk scene in mm -hmm. England was driven by that, that you get these kids who have no really- No future. No seen future. So it's a story about that. Um, but I want to try to get the, the music I wrote for that was was good, it's a lot of chord changes, but it really kind of stayed within the key, and I wanted to kind of get some more edge to it, more um, tension. Um, and we contacted Mike Garson, um, we worked with on our second record, he played a, on a piece, and Mike Garson has been a long time pianist for David Bowie, and he added this brilliant work to that song. And one of the things we did, we did a, a Skype interview with Mike, and we're going to share some of that Skype interview at the show. So you'll get to see Mike talk about working with us. And, and I'm not doing the edit on that, Thomas is doing it, but uh, he talks about his, some of his really personal experiences with David Bowie, and it's, it's pretty fun. And so that wraps the whole thing back up into a nice little package and ties it with a nice little bow. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Sounds great. Looking forward to the 23rd. Yes, we'll see you on the 23rd. Thank, Thank you, Dennis. Jeff. And check out Vanity Crash. You won't be sorry.